Welcome to Talking In Stations, podcast about EVE Online every week. This is the weekly report. Today, we're going to talk about compression. It's definitely going to be something you're, you're interested in at all levels of EVE Online, whether you're a harvester, an industrialist, a miner, or somebody who benefits from their work, you're going to want to know what happens with compression, and we'll know soon enough. We're going to preview that today. Also, worm holders finally get their wish for wormholes, which is the escape route that was filaments are no longer viable inside of wormhole space. So you can't run away to Poshman and you can't run away to NullSec. Also, DBS, ESS, what's all that mean? This is the banking system that was created for NullSec ratting, money making, basically destroying NPCs and gaining money. And that system has been tweaked in order to give players a little bit more money uh, when they do those kinds of endeavors. So a little bit of a buff there for NullSec ratting. And then finally, the event is here, the Valentine's Day event, the uh, Guardians Gala. So we'll take a look at that too and see what's going on there. All right, with me today is Kenneth Feld from CSM 16. Hi, Kenneth. Good morning. Also, we have from CSM 16, Sutonia. Hey, everyone. And engineering is our in-house minor, not minor, but not minor, but minor and ER <laughs> uh, is Nick Bison. How are you doing, Nick? It's a good day, everybody. All right. Let's uh, jump into this compression thing. Can you set us up for a compression, a little bit of when it was first introduced before we get into where we're at now? Yeah. It was originally only on the work wheel. And you had blueprints and you had to use your 10 or possibly 11 manufacturing jobs to run the compressions. This is back in 2000s. And then in 2016, 17, somewhere around there, when they changed the workle to be a mining ship, they basically just made it right click, compress, and it instantly compressed. But only the workle could do it. Devblo came out last year talking about the mining upgrades and talking about they were going to give other ships compression and there were the, going to be these modules and there was tech one and tech two and all this stuff. And it turned out that in order to compress the R64 off of the moon, it would take you about three days and, uh, CCP rightly said, nah, yeah, we're going to rework this and they're reworking it. However, very little information has come out about it publicly. I think CCP Swift said that there's this past week, said there should be a dev blog next week about it, but that's pretty much all that's been said other than a couple of days ago, we got a hobo leaks and everyone looked at it and a lot of people were taken back. The hobo leaks initially only had the skill names in them. They did the skill book names. They did not have a description. Then a couple days later, we got a description and then they were put on TQ. No one knew why they were just put on TQ, but you couldn't buy them. They were just there, which really got people worked up. Then their guardians gala event started and it turned out that the Guardians Gala event was turned into like a, I guess a lore event is a good way to put it, that what's an angel and Serpenta stole some ore technology and ore is giving out these skill books and up to about 50 billion ISK for returning some data fragments and researchers and stuff back to ore. But still, no one really knows what these skill books are for. They're just there. But the names of them are quite interesting. By the way, OR stands for Outer Ring Excavations, which is an NPC corporation. And they're the ones that develop all the mining technology. So one of them, there's two that have basically have the same name. Shipboard Compression Technology and Capital Shipboard Compression Technology. They basically have the same attributes, same everything, except for one is for capital ships equipped with the industry core and one is for subcapital ships equipped with industrial cores. Right now, that is only the Orca that can run an industrial core. But obviously this is how, how the new compression 
looks to be run using those two skill books. And then there's a gas decompression efficiency. All we know about that is that it reduces or it increases the efficiency by 1% per level. That's all we know about that. But we don't know any of the base compression or anything to do with that. So it increases efficiency 5%, but we don't know where we're starting. So there's not much you can say about that. And then the last skill book is the most interesting. And the people with tin Reynolds is out of Reynolds wrap. It's gone. The tin foil is just used. They, they got tin foil itis. It's a fleet compression logistics. And it says this fleet support skill increases the range at which fleet members can use remote compression services offered by a ship operating an industrial core and compression technology, which if you look at the other skills are shipboard compression technology. So that's, you could make that inference pretty easily. And it says each level increases the 10%, the range from the industrial core ship within which remote compression can be used by other fleet members. The skill is intended for use by pilots operating industrial core and compressor modules. So it's quite obvious that the first two skills are for the ship to do it. And it looks like it's possible that ships in a fleet may be able to compress their own stuff using the Rorqual or the Orca as a, as like a mother ship there. That's kind of what it leads you to believe. But no one knows for sure until the dev ball comes out. But those are, you can make that inference pretty easily. The other thing is these four skill books became available in the Guardians Gala event. And I want to point out something to people so you don't get ripped off in Jita. If you look in the attributes tab, it clearly shows that this fleet compression logistics base price is 300 million is. Last time I saw a Jita, they were going for about 750 bill or 750 mil, I'm sorry. So more than double the price. So just be careful there on the price when you go to Gita to buy them. And the other skills like the, the decompression, this one's 75 million. And then both of these are 150 million. So just be careful when you go to Gita because the people that have gotten them earlier, are obviously going to want to sell them for a tidy profits, but that's how much they're going to cost when it comes to TQ. Would it be safe to guess that these are at some point after the gala going to be NPC purchasable? I, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be. Now, how you get them, whether you have to have an or LP or something like that, I'm hoping the dev blog will, uh, will sort that out, or maybe there's something in, in the published true. No, I'm not sure. Maybe in the SDE, there might be something that says where they come from or something like that. I, I don't, I know, I just can't say, but yeah. <laughs> I was convinced you didn't know. I tried. <laughs> I tried. Do you know, Suetonia? No, I actually have no idea. I, I kind of feel like there could be three different ways, right? The first would be, they just are in the, you can just buy them remotely in the character sheet, wherever you are. They could also do them like the mission skill books. Was it military connections, security connections, those kind of skill books where you can't buy them directly. You have to buy them with LP. And in this case, I would assume they would be, you, you go to the ore stations and you buy these skill books from LP and they would only come from there. Also the abyssal ore things, right? Where they come from the Triglavian LP or in Pochman, or they would just put them in the default, like school stations. I'd say like most likely it would be the ore LP option. But it could be the other two too. That way, it'll keep a nice high price on them uh, on the marketplace because they're a little harder to get than just buying it off an NPC station. That makes yeah, sense. It, in, in all fairness, I don't think they've put it out to CSM 16 as a whole. I, but there's certain parts that I try and keep my finger on, and there's certain parts that Suetonia tries to keep his finger on, and our parts probably don't overlap a, a whole lot. Yeah. No, I figure it. Okay. So compression, what was the problem with compression before, as far as players were concerned, what were they worried about? And are there signs that those worries have been assaged? Is that the word? No, there's nothing in this. 
everyone wants right click, give me bacon. And then we went from right click, give me bacon to three and a half days to get your bacon. And this only talks about the modules, but doesn't do anything to explain the modules or how it works, whether it takes 20 minutes or 15 or how much you can do at a time. None of that is covered. All we have is before and the dev blog from last December, which or November, whenever it came out, that, that was a, a scrapped. And now they have the new stuff, which the dev blog has yet to come out for. So no one really knows. Antonio, wh why do you think compression is so important to industrialists and players in general? Well, I mean, it's important because of logistics, right? Like uh, people who harvest remotely need to be able to get their stuff you know, to Jitter to sell it or to production stations. And people who want to buy it want to buy what they need without having to pick it up from like 20 different stations. In particular, recently in the April of last year with the rebalancing to industry as well, we've seen like gas become like a big bottleneck and people are mining it, uh, especially if you look at the MER, but the thing is gas is so uh, painful to move that it's very difficult to bring it out of wormholes or bring it away from the, these specific areas where you can mine it. Uh, gas in Nolsec is only in eight regions the specific gas and they're in one constellation. So you have to, as a necessity, move it around, especially because like, I believe like Galanti caps, for example, you need to take gas from cloud ring and gas from fountain and, and combine that with gas that you get from Placid and gas that you get from essence, I believe it is, uh, together, which is always like four regions. And even that, that's like quite difficult to do. And that's just the Galanti side of things. If you wanted to build a, a bigger ship, like a super, you need to take gas from the, all over the universe. So it, it's crazy. And so this is going to help a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's itself is quite large too. You're either in all four empires mining your own gas or, uh, what do they call it now? It's not huffing. It's scooping the lower tier ones are scoopers. And then the ones are on exhumers and mining barges are called harvesters. Okay. Scooping your own gas. Or you have to buy it off somebody else. And in order to make it worthwhile for them, they have to be able to transport logistics, that gas to the central market hub in order to sell it. And compression would help with transporting more of it with less effort. Nick's going to benefit from this quite a bit, potentially, if he could ever figure out how to compress his moon ore. Because how much, how many cubic meters do you have after a weekend of mining there, Nick? About 13 million. Yeah. Just for an idea, PL's last mining weekend, we had 193 million cubic meters of moon ore in 34 hours of mining. I'm trying not to get too excited in reading this because <laughs> it doesn't, even though it does pretty much address the orca being able to do that, there's no limiters as far as a security status. So will that be available in high sec? I just don't know yet. So I'm not going to get excited until I find out. It really comes down to the specialized compressor modules, right? Whether or not the Orca can use the moon or compression module that, cause it could be locked to ship. That's going to be the, and the same for is the porpoise going to be able to do it because the porpoise got left out of everything. I would really personally love to see the porpoise be able to compress gas. I've said that since before the original mining block, that would be awesome. But what we have here in Hobo Leaks doesn't address it or talk about it at all. That'll have to be next week. The porpoise is the smallest of the industrial ships and those that would be useful in getting it into wormhole space where there's gas to actually compress. Yeah. Smallest of the industrial command ships that give bonuses out. But you can move an orca into wormholes. It's just that. It's a big ship, so it'll close holes behind it. Sometimes. Yeah, and it, it also can't get into any uh, wormhole that's like under a class uh, two, I believe. And it also takes four hours to align and warp out, <laughs> yeah. roughly. So a porpoise would be really beneficial for wormhole exploring gas miners. Also, that, especially when people from high sec who just want to dive in for the day or the weekend. That's, that was what that ship was made for. Not only their 
we found a, a nice use of it. Porpoise with a couple of endurance jumping into low sec and snagging off somebody's moon. Not that I would do anything like that, but I've heard that people do. So the compression on its way, look for it probably next week. All this is happening before FanFest, right? We're expecting a lot of stuff to be talked about during FanFest, but there's still, CCP is still delivering some of quarter four. We're actually still in quarter four, which is weird because we're in February of this year, but it's the quarter system is not quarter system. It's like it's a CCP oh. has never actually <laughs> defined what is a quadrant. They kind of make it up as they go. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like key three was like super short, but then key four has been like five months now. Right. Let's face it. They, they got some things that they pulled back and so it extended their time. And that's the obvious, they probably would have been finished by now if nobody. Well, quadrant one didn't start till February the 6th of 2021. So that's, yeah, that's you know, true. it's, they just make stuff up as they go. It's all good. It's quadrant of two years, right? Yeah. That's marketing speak 101 right there. Just make up shit. <laughs> all right. So that's a compression on its way. And something else that came out and that's already, oh, by the way, is there anything else in Hobo Leaks that we need to cover? What, one other thing, this was a couple of weeks ago. I think it went on TQ on February the 1st. There was a lot of talk about the, ore, the actual size of the asteroid being bigger when they doubled the size of the ore and bouncing off and not being able to align and warp out and all this stuff. So what they did, I have it up on the screen, but basically they took the asteroid radius size multiplier for almost every, everything in the system, all the way, all the, all of the ores that are the cousins for missions, all the moon asteroids, all the ice, everything, and basically made it half of its current size so that they would basically, when they doubled the ore, but they halved the size. So now it's back to the size it was before the doubling, essentially. And I've got a lot of reports that the, the general crescent shape of the belts are back and everything basically looks normal. It looks normal. And I think I may have brought this up to you some other time, but we've been watching it fairly closely and it looks like, the, and I'm not positive, but it looks like the quantities have dropped back down on the high sec crescent shaped ones. I'll get some more scans on that and get you better data. Okay. The crescent shape apparently was a big deal for some miners. Uh, anybody know why? Absolutely. Because high sec miners of which I include myself are a lazy bunch and they want to zoom in to one spot, you know, warp my little group in and hit every rock that's in that asteroid belt. When they were the ball shaped massive ones, you had to go out send somebody scout, make a couple of bookmarks so that you could efficiently hit everything around the area. And that's literally the biggest complaint of, oh, I, I ran into the rock when I worked. Well, don't warp to zero, scout it out. And that's what we had to do. I love my high sec mining. Don't get me wrong, but some people are lazy. There's probably some people that have had high sec bookmarks on those belts for 15 plus years, mining the same belts over and over. And the size change messed all that up. And now if the size change goes back, those old bookmarks are still usable. Again. I've seen a lot of celebration about that. In fact, a couple of miners have actually returned to mining since that. So I guess it's an important change that, that that crescent shape that kind of wraps the asteroid belt around the beacon and allows you to efficiently mine without moving too much. Yeah, there was a few cases where it was like super annoying too. There were certain ice belts where the like dark, there was like a dark glitter rock, but because it was double the size as it was before, it covered like the actual warp in. So if you warp to an ice belt at zero, you would land like on the edge of this dark glitter rock and it would move you off to like 30 kilometers away or something. Like it was super annoying. I had the exact same thing happen to me in one of the belts, you know, when that first happened, fat, dumb, and lazy, I warped my orca and a couple of Mackinaws. And boy, we bounced. That's the first time I think I've ever had an orca over 5k a second. If you had a moon with a 60 day pull with the largest asteroids too, when they came in to make the belt, they would start overlapping and two Titans sit next to each other. They would start bouncing off each other 
you're trying to mine this rock and the rock goes flying across at 16 K per second. <laughs> and then it gets so far away and goes, Hey, I shouldn't be here and works instantly back to where it started. There was some of that going on. Cause remember when the, when moons first came out, if you wanted to mine them right away while they're forming that little ring, people would web them and slow them down enough to mine them before they would make it out to that ring. So they turn off all those, they turned it, made it so you can't use all those effects on the rocks. Rightfully so, you shouldn't be able to web a rock. But now they just get so far away and they snap back to where they should be. And it was causing a lot of issues there as well. But you should be able to tractor beam a rock, maybe not web it, because you're not electronically interfering with a rock, but you could grab a mass in space and tether it or hold it. That would be logical. I still can't tractor a corpse, so why should I be able to get a rock? But you can tractor a corpse if you use the Blood Raider MTE. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are some sick people. I always wanted to drag my victim I behind me. Let's move on to wormholes. This is a big deal. So Tony, maybe you could take this one. Filaments have changed. Do you want to describe what filaments are and, and why they've changed? Yeah. So specifically we're talking about the filaments that take you to another area of space rather than the PVE abyssal ones. So we're talking about the Potron ones, the ones taking to Potron and the needle jack ones, which takes you to a, a system in no security space. Those, those have been blocked from being activated in wormhole space now. This was a change that the wormhole community felt really strongly about because you could use these filaments to basically avoid a PVP. A very common strategy was for people running PVE fleets, they're called roaching fleets with, you know, 10 to 15 people in NOSEC. What they would do is they would just kick whoever's tackled because the drifters always tack, like they don't spread tackle. They always like just leave all of their scrams on one guy, kick that guy from fleet and then fleet wolf off into a safe. And then they could instantly teleport out and there was nothing you could do. So they could just sacrifice one person, but it's, it, that's like a lizard dropping its tail so it can escape. Yeah. <laughs> Basically you just like sacrifice one guy, or whatever cost of doing business. And then you teleport out to Potion where you're safe. You can instantly dock. There was a, there was one Potion filament specifically that you could use that would always, they'd take you to a certain clade where there's always an, there's always a station in every single one of those systems. So you are hundred percent safe, no matter what, basically, if you use that filament. The wormholers didn't like that, right? People were escaping. Yeah. There. Yeah. So it made it, so it's like way harder to kill PVE groups. People were also using it to get stuff out during eviction because you could just undock your ship, warp to a safe and then the filament out with your ship without having to extract it through wormholes. That's why like hole control, et cetera, was super important. Uh, you can still, you know, you put your ships in a freighter or something can log off, but then that takes like more resources. You need the freighter there. And then you need to control the hole at some point in the future to get it out. And people were also in the other way as well. People were using this offensively in, ev in eviction attempts where you start an eviction on someone and the if the defenders actually show up or they maybe get some help. Oh, you go, oh, okay, no problem. We'll just teleport our eviction fleet out. So now they don't get anything when they should be able to kill you and punish you for trying to evict them. So it's a, a very good change, I think. Yeah. And for people who want to use them legitimately, like people who want to go to farm Potrin or people who want to roam Nolsec, it, it's not that hard to have a, a case-based connection somewhere in your chain. You normally have to go like one or two systems out to get one, right? So it, it's not going to inhibit people who actually want to do PVP or people who actually want to go, go to Potron, but it is going to take away a lot of that degenerate wormhole gameplay away. Yeah. So that's a, an important point here is there were strategies that people were using to escape being punished in wormhole space and CCP has said those filaments don't work anymore. So you can't use that to get away from uh, danger. That's the change here. That's big. And that's why wormholers are happy because now they can probably get more kills. Yeah, no, wormhole space is also meant to be the wild west. So, you know, being able to just instantly get away from it is a bit of a issue thematically as well. What do you think about it, Sir Tony? I, I think it's a very good change. I think there's almost no uh, negatives around it and almost all positives. That's funny. That's what they said about filaments in the first place, right? Nobody could think of any negatives. Yeah. 
The initial needle jack filaments weren't that big of a deal uh, for wormholes as much as the potchman filaments were, because the potchman filaments allow you to instantly get back to, uh, well, not instantly, but you, you can like instantly appear in a system that has a station, and then you can probe a wormhole out or you know teleport out back to a jitter in high security space really easily. Nullsec wasn't quite as easy because you could end up in the middle of delve with your fleet, and then you, you're probably just as dead as you were. So it wasn't like super safe or you could end up like in, in the middle of nowhere and it, you'd have to go like 30 jumps to get back to Jitter, back to your hole or whatever. So like the Nullsec ones weren't as egregious, but the, the Pochum ones were really the, the problem, but both the, but they're all banned now, which I think is probably a good change. Yeah. The Pochvin ones being an additional problem because you get to Pochvin and then you're one one step out of high sec, so you're pretty safe as opposed to the null sec ones. You just uh, wait the 15 minutes and you can do the second filament to get out of Pochman and you're guaranteed high sec. What do you think yeah. of it, Kenneth, these changes? And why didn't they just do the timer? Remember like the spool up so that people can't escape right away. It takes them five, three minutes to. It's just too much. Why make it complex when it doesn't need to be? Just turn them off. They, they should have never been in wormholes. Let's say you want to explore wormholes as a solo player and you're just looking around, you're not ratting or whatever, but you have casual play schedule. You can only play a few hours and you want to make sure you get back to your station. So that's where you begin tomorrow. Wouldn't the filaments work in that sense? You could do shallow wormhole exploration, right? Where you only go like one or two jumps deep and you stay around your area. So instead of going deep into wormhole space, what you can do is say, I go one jump away from the system I'm based. I probe this wormhole here, there. I go into that wormhole. Then when I get what I want out of that wormhole, I come out of it. And then maybe I go an I know another jump in my own space and then go into another wormhole in there. You can do that, right? Like shallow wormhole exploration. Yeah. Call Eve Scout. They'll get you. That's right. That's right. There's a question out of the chat that I found rather interesting. Why is it not okay to escape a wormhole, but I can shoot a bunch of people in null? and then filament away. You, you, they have 15 minutes to catch you, right? If, if you shoot them, then you get a 15 minute PVP timer. You can't use a filament with a PVP timer. I know some people, what they do is they, they warp to an area where it's pretty hard to catch them, like the ESS grid, because it's dead space and they burn off for 15 minutes. The, the other thing <laughs> is he's talking about escaping wormholes. In wormholes, when someone kills a Citadel, 100% of the loot drops, there's no asset safety. So if people are loading up DSTs with 65 or 70,000 cubic meters worth of stuff, undocking and then filamenting to safety, you, you could put a couple hundred billion, depending on what it is in that DST and do it four or five times. And you're essentially denying the attackers that loot. And that loot was never meant to be denied. If you put down a citadel in a wormhole and put something in it, whatever you put in it should be available to the attackers. You shouldn't have an easy exit. That's basically, you can do it from being tethered. So, or maybe not, but it's close enough. But if they have hole control, you can't get out and have an, a, a basically a giant parachute strapped to your back is not in the how the wormholes were designed when citadels were put in. Yeah. I'm not trying to be argumentative more than normal, but that sure makes a uh, null sec kind of safe with just a right click asset safety. Yeah, no, that doesn't exist there. But the, the, the filaments essentially made it that way because they could just filament their stuff out. And, and that was essentially asset safety for them. Using filaments as a workaround for asset safety penalty inside of wormholes. Correct. <laughs> no longer possible. Correct. All right, cool. We'll see how that goes. Not a big surprise that it happened. It was something that was requested for at least six to months to a year from wormholers. That was one of their big agitation points. So if they finally got what they wished for pretty much the way they wanted it. So. There it is. Next is a big change that's happened. Maybe not such a big change, but it looks like the dynamic bounty system in NullSec and the uh, encounter surveillance system, the ESS, have changed their payout ratios and their how much money it sequesters. 
one of you guys explain what that is and how it works and how it's changed. So before you had in the old, what's happened, what's mostly changed, right? Is they've changed how much money goes inside the reserve bank so that now uh, when you run in a system, even if you're in the, uh, I say the first thing that's worth putting out is before the worst a system could ever get was at 30%, where you'd get 30% of your riding ticks. You'd get 18%, I think, directly, and then 12% goes into the pool, and then there was like a bit in the reserve bank too. So you got, got a bit more than 30%. But uh, that was like the lowest point. Now that's been bumped up to 50%. So now the worst you'll ever get is half your bounties. And what they've done is they've uh, boosted up the amount that goes into the ESS reserve bank so that you'll always get a hundred percent of your bounties in some form. So now, for example, if you write in a 50% system, you would get 30% is what you keep. 20% goes into the main bank, which you'll get after two, two hours approximately. And then the other 50% goes into the ESS reserve bank. So now uh, you always get the 100% of your bounties, even at the lowest possible point at 50%. And it's like scales directly up, right? There's no longer a function of sync in here with money sinking out of the game or potential money sinking out of the game. But there still, there still can be. If, so, if someone uh, takes from the bank, right? Like you only get 70% of the value or something. So money can get destroyed then, but now nothing goes poof. Nothing from directly from ratting goes poof. Everything goes somewhere. And it can be destroyed between two people fighting over it, but nature itself hasn't made it go poof, uh, gone. So is this a plus or a minus for ratters and hunters inside of Nelsec? It's a bit of a, uh, I think it's a, <laughs> somebody wants to keep him quiet. <laughs> Here he comes back. Yeah. Basically it just comes down to, it puts more money in the reserve bank. And I think a lot of the, especially no suckers want it in the main bank so they can get it right away. But now it's up to CCP. And I know that the, the CSM is driving it too, to give us more ways to access the reserve bank and make that gameplay more important and emergent type thing so that you can steal them and, and get that isk and keep the alliances from self-harvesting it. Yeah. So even before this change, right, the, the amount of keys that were dropping were less than the amount of money that was going into the reserve bank. So there was already like a surplus, like even if every single key that dropped was being used to take from a reserve bank, like there would still be more money in the reserve banks than what would be possible to take with the keys. So now with this change on top of that, it's like obviously going to be even higher. We can put forth several ideas that CCP is looking at to make them more available. Sorry, this was one of them or this put more money in the reserve bank. So CSM had a incredible. brainstorm session with CCP course, last week. It's, we put forth several ideas to ready. be implemented so that the reserve bank is more accessible by players. Uh, would you consider it inaccessible now? Yeah, it's a bit right now, right? Like the money really only ever goes to like the person who buys the key and then they make a small bit of profit on it or it gets nationalized. Like I think like fraternity and horde do this where they have like biodas up for the keys and the SIG groups, these special interest groups that go to low sector farm this and then they sell the keys to the Alliance and then the Alliance uses them. And then you also have the PVPers who get the keys themselves, who takes it, but it very rarely goes to the actual ratter, the money that's in the reserve bank right now. Oh, the reserve bank. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Pe bank. People like if you ran into a reserve bank, you're not the money that you put into a reserve bank, you are probably not seeing it. All right. So that's the changes for a DBS slash ESS system out there. I, I saw some people talk about it, but nobody seemed to be angry or agitated or excited. So it seems like it's. I actually thought there was a lot of excitement initially when people thought it was going into the main bank. So a lot of people were excited, were excited about that prospect, right? Because the main bank seems like such a great, everyone seems like pretty happy with it. Mm. And people thought, oh, well, I'm going to get more ISK. It's just that people would, would that like, I'd ha just have to be more active in defending it. And you know, roaming gangs might be able to steal more from me.
Mm-hmm. But, but I'll, I'll be getting more overall. But actually, all of the extra stuff is going into the Reserve Bank. So it, the excitement for that kind of died out at the end of the day when people realized that. I see. And now Kenneth's statement makes a lot more sense that CSM is aware of that pain point and has talked to CCP about it. Guardians Gala. So this is another event, not unlike the Doctor Who event that we just went through or Convergence event. That the Convergence event was very simple to get involved with, and it was relatively easy to survive encounters. This new event, the Guardians Gala, is a pretty tough event. It's hard to find, and you have to be relatively well equipped to fight your way through this. But there's uh, some really big money to be made here, especially if you find one of the lucrative scientists. Can you guys tell us about the the Guardians Gala, whoever is participating in it? So there's uh, there's Guardian Gala combat sites that spawn all over uh, New Eden. So that would be a uh, K space and wormhole space. There's also a, a slightly better uh, VIP site which only spawns in wormhole space or in two constellations. So one, which is in curse in the heaven constellation, which is the angel cartel home. And then I believe one in the Phoenix constellation in fountain, which is the Serpentis home in the law. So you want to go to fountain or curse it. If you have, if you can in Nosek, or you need to go to wormhole space. If you want to run the, the VIP sites and the VIP sites have a much more lucrative loot. And they have the chance to drop one of those uh, or research, uh, guys. I think there's only going to be 50 total that a drop. I'm not sure. But they tuned it so that if the average number of sites ran oh, last that's... year is roughly the same as this year, then it's going to drop about 50. However, oh, okay. if more sites get run this year. It could be 55 If less sites. It could be a few less. Yeah. So there's not a hard cap of 50, but approximately 50 will drop. And you can sell those, uh, in the ore stations for 1 billion isk each. Wow. Yeah. The, the patch notes say roughly 50. They're not really sure how many got killed and how many got abducted. So they're paying 1 billion isk for any of them that get returned. Well, it's good to be a scientist. The nice reward to be recovered. So all of these uh, sites, they drop all research data fragments at the end from the boss. Kenneth talked about this earlier with the skill books, but basically you can take those data fragments to the uh, ore stations in outer ring. Once you get enough of them, you can turn them in the LP store. They require zero LP. So you don't need to uh, actually run any ore missions or anything. You just need the data fragments and you can turn them in for the skill books to get them earlier than when they release properly, when the compression update comes out. There's also, uh, skins, uh, and stuff like that, the spirit skin line which was there before. There's also a, a reward track of where you get some more skins for the, I believe it's the Serpentis and Angel Cartel ships. There's a bunch of new boosters, which are really overpowered and just the normal event fair stuff like fireworks, trinket items, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And on the market, they've actually re-released the Eros Blossom skins, which we haven't seen in at least two years. Those go for Billy. Heart Surge. Heart Surge comes out every year, yes. But yeah, the Valentine skins. Yeah. But the uh, the Blossom ones, the Eros Blossom skins, I think they were associated with fundraising the first time they came out. I think you're thinking of the Rosada Dawn skins. Oh, you're you're right. right. Yes, you're absolutely right. These, these ones I think have never been fundraising. They're just limited edition in the store. I don't know why I'm so fond of those skins. They look. It's because they're pink. Everyone loves pink skins. No, there's something romantic about Eros Blossom skins. And I think it's at a time when I was listening to a lot of Eve podcasts, I heard people talking about the Guardians Gala and they said, yeah, and these Eros Blossom skins are out. And I was like, I was not a skin fan, but I decided to go ahead and look at them. And there was just something about that era of change in Eve that maybe it's merged onto. There's something about those skins. It's very special for me. I haven't figured out why. Anyway, one other thing I had a question about how hard is it to get involved in Guardians Gallop? So they're tuned to be, I think the basic ones, they're tuned to be runnable in like a, 
in a heavy assault cruiser or like a decent fit battleship generally. I, I was running, I ran the hard sides in a Hyperion, a solo, the, I believe the, the easier sides could probably be run with just standard heavy assault cruiser, like Cerberus, Loki, Vagabonds, those kind of ones that people normally run. You could probably do the easy ones in a battle cruiser maybe, but it might be pushing it a little bit. Yeah. There's also exploration content too, though, that you can just, you can do those uh, pretty easily in like tech one frigates, etc. If you don't have the skill points to fly hacks or battleships. And not to throw fellow CSM member Billy under the bus, but I know that him and CCP Swift were happy because there's a new clothing, something or other that goes along with this. They were all happy about some dress or something. I don't really know, but there's probably <laughs> some clothing that goes along with this Guardians Gala as well. So the Angel Cartel is from Curse. What's your impression of Curse? Curse is just a good place to stage out of if you want to mess around with the locals. It's a good place as well for smaller PvP focused alliances because you have the burn emission constellation. You can make some decent isk down there. And then you can also hunt officers. I guess it's not as good as it used to be because of the belt change. But you can make pretty decent like money in Curse without having to invest in like a lot of sub upgrades and things like you have to do in default null. And then Curse also has tons of stations, so it can support quite a few groups living out of there. Like almost every, I think every constellation has four or five stations that you can use, probably more than that. So you have tons of areas. Basically, it's just a great place to stage out of as an alliance if you don't really have much infrastructure yet or you don't want to invest in it. And then you want to just mess with someone in the surrounding area, like in a catch, Amencia, Providence, that kind of area. The one thing about Curse is there's two or three gates in Curse where you go a significant amount of distance by going through a regular gate. So depending on what little area of Curse that you're in, you can bridge to several other different regions of oh. NullSec and even LowSec from there as well. So if you're based out of this station, you could go two jumps through a gate and bridge and be like four regions away type thing. It's very long and narrow. So it's very easy to get to many areas of space from Curse. You have groups like the Initiative, they're using it to stage and use as like a forward operating base to harass people. I think Fountain has that same characteristic, doesn't it? With the Serpentis Prime area or PC area. Yeah, I don't think Fountain is, is not as good as Curse because like Kenneth said, you don't get as much like region hopping out of Fountain. You can. Yeah. There's like a big gate and fountain that, that you can take that's like close to Delve back up to Outer Ring, but it's not nearly as much as like in Curse where you have like four regions basically. Yeah. That's interesting. All right. By the way, Curse, I think in early Eve was occupied by Russians most of the time. Stain and Curse. And also a lot of groups seem to be born in Curse too. Destructive Influence, Arcane Technologies. This group was all running around Curse. There was the Curse Alliance. It's lots of history and Curse. All right. So anyway, Guardians Gala, Curse, Fountain, Wormholes gets you to the chance to find a scientist in a loot drop. And if you turn that scientist back in, it's a billion. Ask for you. Otherwise, Guardians Gala, I think you can find all over the place. You probably need Battle Cruiser or above for the more complicated combat sites, but you can participate in the exploration sites with frigates and that sort of thing. Cool. Anything else you guys want to talk about before we go? So Tony, what have you been up to? I've been busy with the, with CSM stuff that's not released yet, but there's like tons of really exciting stuff. I think you guys are going to teaser of it and the blog that should be coming next week, but uh, some really good changes. My stuff's kind of winding down. Once compression is over, a lot of the industry stuff, remember the dominoes I kept talking about? We're, we're running out of dominoes. So it'll move on to other things. And then are they still said back in December or whenever that end of the year industry thing that they were going to look at capital prices or dread prices or something? They were going to look at 
something along there. That's still kind of going on in the background and a few other things, but um, really looking forward to compression update because this will be the first carrot that we've had in quite a while. So you're saying this is going to be good for people who were hurt by the scarcity era. Well, it's not going to be bad. Let's just put it like that. Okay. I, I don't know if it'll make up for everything, but you'll find out more next week. Nick, what about you? What have you been doing? Just setting up my little tiny high sec area that I'm playing in right now. Time's been a premium. So linking together with a couple other folks and I do a little ninja low sec mining and Somebody leaves their little R16 unguided. We'll be happy to take that over from you. And uh, we'll leave off with this. Don't forget to watch episode two of the Travelers, uh, New Eden Travelers, that is a series put together by Katya Say and Mark726. Both of them very notable players for their exploration and their lore. So check that out. Episode two of the Travelers. And this one is, I believe, Major Tom, which is a neat little mystery. So check it out. Find out more information on that. We have a link for you. I'll go ahead and put it in chat now. I beat you to it. Good. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks very much to Tonia and Kenneth for coming around. Thanks for engineering, Nick. And we'll see you guys next time on Talking In Stations.